Mark chapter 8, and we'll begin in verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and brought him out of the village. Spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people, they look like trees walking. Again, Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes. The man looked intently and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Then he sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Let's pray. Abba, Father, you are our dad. You are our heavenly father. And just like any earthly parent, when you speak, you want your children to hear and to understand what you tell them. And so I know it is your will this morning, Lord, that we hear and understand your commandments, that we hear and understand your word. And so I ask for your help in sharing it this morning. And I ask you to help us to hear and to listen and help us to understand. Lord, we ask you to do a work here this morning. In the precious name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, In this passage, we find something unusual recorded in the Bible. Something we see happening nowhere else in Scripture. We find Jesus partially healing a man, asking him if he was healed, and then touching him a second time. Very Unusual and something we find recorded nowhere else in Scripture that Jesus touched someone twice in order to heal them. Why did Jesus touch the man a second time? Is it possible that it took Jesus two times, two tries to heal the man? Is it possible that Jesus didn't know what he was doing, that he was unsure of how to heal this particular man? No, it's not that Jesus was unable to do something on his first try. Genesis chapter 1 tells us in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And John chapter 1 tells us how he did that. He created the heavens and the earth through the instrumentality of his son Jesus Christ. For in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So God the Father made all things, but He did it through the instrumentality of His Son, Jesus Christ, God the Son. The Bible records, God saying in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And David recorded in Psalm 139, verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Now, if God through Jesus made us, and made us wonderfully, is it possible that it took Jesus two attempts to heal this man's eyes? Is it possible that Jesus was incapable of healing him on his first attempt? No, such a thing is beyond the pale. Such a thing is beyond the realm of possibilities. If Jesus can raise the dead, and he did, if Jesus can multiply loaves and fishes and feed hundreds and thousands, and he did, if Jesus can walk on the water and calm the storms and cast demons out of people, and he did, if Jesus can hang all of the stars and the constellations in the heavens and call them by name, and he can, then there is no way that Jesus would have to take two attempts in order to heal someone. Then why the second touch? Before I address that question, before we go into the house, 
I'd like us to stand here on the porch for just a couple of minutes and look at look around at a few things. First notice, if you will, there in verse 22. We're told they came to Bethsaida. They brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. In verse 22, we notice that Jesus and his disciples came to Bethsaida. Jesus and his disciples moved around a lot when Jesus had his earthly ministry. Jesus ministered to the multitudes. He would heal them. He would teach them. And then when their, when their request became too great, when their pressing became too great, when the crowds became too numerous, when their demands became overwhelming, Jesus would take his disciples and would slip off into a quiet place so that he could continue to teach and to disciple them because he wanted to spend time with the twelve growing and discipling them. You see, Jesus would rather have 12 followers than a crowd of fans. He would rather have 12 who are committed than a multitude who are curious. What did Jesus tell us are the requirements for discipleship? Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In Luke chapter 14, beginning of verse 25, we are told now great crowds were traveling with him. So he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus told us to go and make disciples. He didn't tell us to make church attenders. He told us to make disciples. People who are full down and committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. People who have a going and growing relationship with Him, becoming more like Him each day. Folks that people can legitimately legitimately call Christians because when they look at those folks they see the traits the qualities and the love and character of Jesus reflected in their lives let me ask you my friend are you a disciple of Jesus Christ is he a priority in your life is your greatest goal to serve and to please him in his journeys, Jesus and the disciples came to Bethsaida, where some bring a blind man out for Jesus to touch. Look there again, if you will, please, verse 22. They came to Bethsaida. They brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. Did you notice who it was that brought the blind man out to Jesus? It was they. We don't even know who they are. It is, it's an unnamed, unknown group of people. We live in a day and a time and an age where people want to be known. My word, these days people are tweeting and posting and blogging, all crying out, look at me. It amazes me some of the things people will post online. Can I be honest with you for a minute? Just between you and me, number one, I don't care what you ate for supper. With the second coming of Jesus Christ on the horizon, with His arrival imminent in billions of people around the world, not yet knowing Him, with the little retirement Gladys and I have been able to set aside over the years to carry us on to our golden years with the value of that retirement diminishing every day because of the rise of inflation. Honestly, I really don't care what you had for supper. I care nothing about seeing a picture of you browning hamburger as you talk about what you're fixing for dinner. And number two, if you and your significant other are fighting or your children are being jerks, 
Do you really think the world wants to know about your dirty laundry? Some things are best kept at home. Behind closed doors and dealt with within the confines of the house. Everybody on Facebook and Twitter doesn't need to know about all of the issues going on at your house. If you want to talk to somebody about it, talk to Jesus about it. He's the one that can help. Oh, and while I'm at it, you're not married to the greatest wife in the world. I am. And besides, Drew has a great daddy, okay? People doing all kinds of things just to be noticed. But in the midst of all of this, they brought a man to Jesus. We don't read their biographies. We don't know their names. All we know about these people is that they brought someone to Jesus. Now, there are people all over the place building buildings and wanting their names hung on that bu building. Or their name hung on a business. Or streets, highways, interstates named after them. And most people seeing those names have no clue who those people are. Names, reputations quickly forgotten. But here we have a group of people, they, that all the Christians in the world have read about. Why? Because they're bringing somebody to Jesus. And let me tell you, that's a group I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of they if they are bringing people to Jesus. My friends, I want you to know that the folks you hang out with, the people you call friends, will impact your life a great deal. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, we are we read, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. In 1 Corinthians, uh, in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, we read, iron sharpens iron, and one person sharpens another. The folks you call friends will make all the difference in the world in your life. Either they will draw you to the Lord and strengthen and help grow your relationship, or they'll pull you away. Either they'll help you in their, your walk with the Lord or they will hinder you in your walk. You and I need around us some people, some friends willing to tear the roof off of the house to get us to Jesus. We need a group of people around us who because of their walk and because of their testimony and because of their prayer are bringing us closer to Jesus every time we encounter them. And in the Bible, God didn't feel it was necessary to list the names of these folks. But He did feel it was important that we saw what they were busy doing. They brought their friends to Jesus. So far, so good. But then they kind of messed up. They brought their friend to Jesus so that Jesus could put his hand on him. Why did they beg Jesus to touch him? Because that's what they thought was necessary in order for the man to get healed. And what did Jesus do? He spit on the man's eyes. You see, when we bring someone to Jesus, there's no telling what Jesus is going to do. And there's no telling how Jesus is going to work in that person's life. I heard that after Pentecost, when they were trying to organize the first church, they were getting together to try to figure out how they would search for Jesus and how the church would grow and how lives would be changed. The man healed here by Jesus, he shouted out, well, what we need to do, we need to spit on people. And they'll get Jesus and their lives will be changed. There was another, a woman who came and 
grabbed the cloak of Jesus and was healed of her flow of blood, she said, no, 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 you got it wrong. She said, if, if you want your life changed, if you want a relationship with Jesus, if you want healing, what you got to do, you got to grab his cloak. And then there was another, the man with a withered hand, he said, no, no, no. If you want to get close to Jesus, if you want to be healed by Jesus, all you need is a spoken word. You stretch out your hand and you'll be healed. And there on the first day of the new church, we had three denominations. We had the first church of the spitters, the first church of the clingers, and the first church of the stretchers. I'm afraid sometimes, my friends, that we emphasize too much the things that set us apart and the things that make us different. Instead of focusing on the things which we have in common. The story is told of a man who was about to jump off a bridge. A preacher came along and hollered at him, don't jump. The man said, I'm going to do it. The preacher said, don't do it. And they asked the man, are, are you a Christian or an atheist? The man answered, I'm a Christian. The preacher responded, great, so am I. The preacher responded, the preacher asked, are you Orthodox, Catholic, or Protestant? The man answered, I'm Protestant. The preacher yelled, great, so am I. The preacher asked him, what denomination are you? Are you Methodist, or Presbyterian, Lutheran, or Baptist, or non-denominational? The man answered, I'm a Baptist. The preacher said, great, so am I. The preacher asked him, what kind of Baptist are you? Are you a Seventh-day Baptist? Are you a Northern Baptist, an American Baptist, an Independent Baptist, a Southern Baptist? What kind of Baptist are you? He said, I'm a Southern Baptist. The preacher said, great, so am I. He said, uh, what, what version of the Baptist faith and message do you cling to? The one of 1925, the one of 1963, or the one of 2000? And the man answered the Baptist faith and message of 2000. The preacher hollered, jump you heretic. Sometimes we're so busy splitting hairs, worrying about how Jesus is going to work, that we try to box him in. Oh, my friends, sometimes Jesus heals one way, and sometimes he heals another. And sometimes Jesus grows people in a church with Sunday school. Sometimes it grows people in a church with Mission Possible Camp. And sometimes it grows people in a church with a one, and sometimes it grows people in a church with a 4-H club. We bodies of the church of Christ, we need to quit comparing ourselves to one another and saying what we do is what you need to do. We need to let Jesus be Jesus. And just be happy. When he works, while here on the porch, I'd like to make one other observation, if I may. What did Jesus do when they first brought the man to him? Jesus took the man outside of town. Jesus got the man away from the crush of the crowd and the press of the people. He got him away from the distractions. He got him away from the noise. He got him away from the sense of urgency. And my friend, there's a time and a place for us to gather with other believers to study and to learn and to be challenged and encouraged. There's a time and a place for us to gather with others to be held accountable and to worship with others. But there are also times when we need to get along with the Lord. Just one-on-one. -on -one. I was meeting with a couple yesterday doing some premarital counseling. And the man asked me, how do you grow as a Christian? How do you become a more mature believer? The Lord said, you will search for me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You want to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You want to become a more mature believer. You make it a priority in your life. You spend time alone with Him, studying His Word, letting Him speak to you. 
You spend time worshiping and praying. Oh, the Bible says, let us not forsake the assembly of ourselves together, but even more so as that we see the day approaching, let us encourage one another. There's a time for gathering and a time for worshiping and a time for challenging one another and for holding one another accountable. There's a time for group worship. But there's also a time for independent worship, just you and the Lord. And time for you to seek answers in the Word of God. David writes in Psalm 63, beginning in verse 1, God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. My lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live. At your name, I will lift up my hands. You satisfy me with, as with rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I think of you as I lie on my bed, I meditate on you during the night watches because you are my helper. I'll rejoice in the shadow of your wings. I follow close to you. Your right hand holds on to me. And these eight short verses, David speaks of a time in the sanctuary and a time on his bed and a time in his night watches, all of them seeking God and worshiping him. All of them are necessary and all are important. You want to grow, you spend time alone with the Lord. Now let's leave the porch and step into the house for just a moment. Why the second touch? Look there again with me if you will please, verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and brought him out of the village. Spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? Did you notice what Jesus asked the man? He asked, What do you see? The only time you'll find Jesus asking someone about a miracle that he did or about a healing he was in the process of doing. He asked the man, how's that working for you? Now, Jesus could have healed the man instantly, as he did so many others. But that's not, not the way he chose to work in this case. I was pastoring in Mississippi. My chairman of deacons there told me about when he became a follower of Jesus Christ. He told me at the time that he became a believer, his desire to smoke disappeared and his desire to drink disappeared. It was all instantly gone. He was instantly healed. And Jesus could have done that in this case, but that's not what he chose to do, and that's not what Jesus does in everyone's case. Sometimes his healing is a little more progressive. Can I heal you? Can I get you over that addiction? Can I do it instantaneously? Yes. But if I did, perhaps then you wouldn't see the need for me anymore. And you go on about your merry way, forgetting completely about me. But no, I'm not going to do it all at once. I'm going to do it a little bit at a time because I want you here close to me. I want you to realize your need and your dependence on me each day. I want you to learn to walk with me and to trust me to get you through that day. And then I'll get you through the next as well. Jesus asked the man, how you doing? And when Jesus did that, he forced the man to own where he was. Now the man could have lied like we so often do in church. The man could have said, I, everything's fine, Jesus. You've healed me. I can see. 
Everything's good. But no, he said, I can see, but not clearly. I'm better than I was, but it ain't right yet. Oh, if there were more of us in the church who didn't pretend like we had all of our sins and all of our temptations under control. If there were more of us in the church who would admit, Lord, uh, I'm better than I was and you brought me along. But Lord, it's still not right. I need another touch. I'm better than I was. I can, I can see better than I used to be able to, but Jesus, it ain't right. I need some more help. I need another touch. You know, I'm afraid some people never get their deliverance because they're worried about their dignity. I don't want to admit the reality that I still need healing in my life. I don't want to admit that I still have struggles in my life. After all, I'm an adult. I'm a dad. I'm a grandmother. I'm a model and I'm an example. I don't want to admit to people that I still have things that I struggle with. I'm doing just fine, Jesus. Thank you. I'll take it from here. Oh, the man told Jesus, I'm better than I was, but I'm not right yet. Jesus, I need another touch. I think Jesus performed the healing here in multiple steps. Not only for the man's sake, but also for the disciples. And I think the Lord had this account positioned exactly where he did in his holy inspired word. Because the disciples needed to see something as well. Look there, if you will, in the passage immediately before this. Look there, if you will, Mark chapter 8 and verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, demanding of him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation demand a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and went to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to take bread and had only one loaf with them in the boat. Then he gave them strict orders. Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They were discussing among themselves that they did not have any bread. Aware of this, he said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Don't you understand or comprehend? Do you have hardened hearts? Do you have eyes and not see and ears and not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of leftovers did you collect? Twelve, they told him. When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you collect? Seven, they said. And he said to them, don't you understand yet? You see, the disciples were in the same situation as some of us are. They had enough faith to follow him but not enough faith to trust it. They needed another touch. They needed to grow and mature a little more. Jesus said, why are you worrying about bread? Didn't you see me multiply the loaves and the fishes and feed all of those thousands of people? And then when I got done, there was more left over than there was to start with. What is the matter with you people? And aren't we sometimes the same way? Oh, we, we trust Jesus. 
save us and someday take us home to heaven. But them bills coming this week. And that family member that I've been praying for. And that struggle that I'm having with a relative. I can't trust him with that. I need another touch. I need to move a little further down the road. Look. Um, Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Jesus went out with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist. Others, Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he strictly warned them to tell no one about him. Then he began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed and rise after three days. He spoke openly about this. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking about God's concerns, but about human concerns. Peter had reached the point where he recognized Jesus was the Messiah. But he had not reached the point where he knew that God's plan was always best. And that God could work in any situation. Jesus said, Who do they say that I am? Peter says, You are the Messiah, the Holy One of God. Elsewhere it tells us that Jesus said, Blessed are you, Peter. Because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but only my Father. Peter, you're doing well. God is showing you things. And then Jesus talks about being crucified. And Peter says, No, no, that's not going to happen. Far be it from you, Jesus. Oh, man. How in the world to have things revealed to you from God one moment and the next morning, moment denying the will of Jesus Christ? Peter hadn't reached where he needed to be yet. He needed another touch. And right between these two accounts, Jesus tells about a man partially healed. We needed to see Jesus again. And I don't know where you are in your walk right now. Perhaps there was a time in your life when you would wake in the morning singing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. But that's been a long time ago. And somewhere along the way you have drifted You're no longer walking with him. You can't remember the last time you talked with him. Perhaps you need another touch. This morning, Jesus said, how you doing? Oh, Jesus, I'm bearing it was. I can see a little bit, but things aren't clear. I need another touch. My friend, where are you and you walk with the Lord? Have you left your first love? Have things become cold? Oh, I praise the Lord that I serve a God, a second chance. A God who will heal us again.